Hello everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, reactive programming and microprofile this session. So I want to explain how to use uh, new modern features to enhance your applications or even how to build your applications from the, from, from the start uh, to make them prepared for the future challenges. Uh, but before I start, uh, let me ask you how many of you know about reactive programming and uh, uh, already probably wrote some applications, at least just the pet projects with reactive APIs. So not much. So I'll so briefly explain what is this about and what we want to try to achieve. Um, I'm going to use uh, MicroProfile, uh, MicroProfile stack, uh, which um, brings a nice set of APIs to meet modern needs. It started as an uh, initiative uh, of uh, people who stood behind Java EE, so it uh, has a Java EE background. Um, and uh, the, the vendors and people who were contributing to Java EE at the time when the Java EE 8 was just about to finalize and was moving fast, they uh, created a new project uh, to collaborate on these APIs and eventually contribute them back to Java EE once everything settled. Uh, many things have changed since then. Uh, the Java EE basically was do donated by Oracle to Eclipse, Eclipse Foundation and was renamed to Jakarta EE. And now we are waiting for all this contribution to f uh, finalize so that we can work on, uh, on Java EE and now, now Jakarta EE APIs um, in the future. And we all hope that we can progress with Jakarta EE APIs uh, very fast, unlike the old Java EE standards. But meanwhile, we already have MicroProfile. And where, where it all started? Uh, a couple of years ago, we, we saw that uh, the world goes to the cloud, to, towards microservices, and, and all this new stuff wasn't covered by standard APIs, uh, uh, mostly in Java EE. Uh, so we saw the need there. So we started talking different companies uh, about how we can move this uh, forward, how, how to unify our approaches. At the time, everybody had, everyone had their own solution. Uh, so Spring Framework had their solution, and every every other server had the, their own APIs, but there was no unified approach. So we started MicroProfile first to address microservices architectures, and now we also address uh, other things, namely reactive uh, approach in, uh, to write applications. So there are, there are already many APIs for to, to cover microservices needs, and we are starting to add more and more APIs to also cover reactive needs. That means right now uh, there are some APIs that already can, we can use and to run reactive applications, but there are also some, API, uh, some things that st we still need to cover and we are working towards to provide uh, unified APIs for those. But now to, to explain what is reactive programming about, I would like to start with goals. But that we need to solve in any application, basically. It's only a matter of if we need to invest into more complexity to, to provide us uh, the tools to, s to tweak our application, or we are happy with our standard approach and we don't need to uh, um, tackle the future challenges. But if we want our applications to behave well and to be interesting for our users uh, and be uh, modern, uh, we want to focus on, on the users, and we need to improve the, the user experience. So if users feel, uh, use our application, they want it to respond fast, they, know want, they want to know what's going on. So that's first goal. The other goal is to, besides having more users, is to also save resources, because when we have more and more users coming to our uh, sites using our services, we also want to make those services cheap for users and also cheap for us, so that we have uh, money from running the service. And in the future, we may expect that we will grow, we will provide services to more and more users, and to keep them happy, we need to keep up with the, the massive amount of data that is processed by our applications. 
So we need to think how to redesign our application to be able to cope with massive loads and to accept more resources, to be flexible without really investing too much into refactoring our application. And in the end, there's also a catch. There's always something you may think, and you would be, you would be right. Because we need to design our application to, to keep up the loads, currently we hit the limit of uh, vertical scaling because we can't just increase CPU, the CPU speed to eternity. So we, to, uh, we tackle this problem by increasing the number of CPUs, increasing the number of machines, then leads to increasing the number of instances of our application to distribute the load onto different resources. And with that, they, they need to communicate through network, and this brings a lot more complexity in communication and also a lot more failures. So before, with a monolithic ap approach with just a handful of instances of our services, we could rely that failure would be a rare thing. With distributed computing, failures are almost happen almost daily. And we need to cope with them so that we don't spend too much time just fixing the, the problems, they should fix themselves <coughs> automatically. And to, to, to solve these problems, our reactive programming provides us tools, or the, the ideology of reactive programming provides us a, a tool that's called reactive pipeline. If you uh, study reactive uh, programming to more details, you would see that uh, the, the the essence of reactive programming is to reactive to events, uh, processing events, sending them further, and always like making some something busy, without waiting for some something. So uh, there's there are also some threads, uh, pro processing things, uh, not waiting for reading data from disk or from somewhere else. They always delegate this to some system that is responsible to. Uh, to take care of uh, the I.O. operations and continuous processing other tasks. So that's the main thing. And the easiest way to approach this is to uh, create pipelines. And pipelines are, uh, uh, I would say, uh, sequences in our code. When we start processing incoming requests, we modify the, the, the data that we have, and the output of the data is sent to somebody else who then listens to, to the data when it comes, it doesn't, the, it doesn't wait. Uh, it only listens when the data is there. So there's no component actively waiting for the data. It just gets notified. Uh, and it means and can do something else uh, when, when there's no data. And then, again, the same process repeats, and you have a, a chain that ends with publishing data some, to somewhere else, by either to the user, to the browser, or, or to other system that is external to our application. And then the, uh, the circle continues. We receive another request and then send published uh, data. In MicroProfile, we have some APIs already, as I said, that support this concept. There's reactive, uh, reactive API in uh, processing REST uh, calls, in calling REST services. Uh, you can also send server send events. Uh, which fits the reactive model because uh, it's an easy way to send messages to another client. Within uh, the same service there are CDI events and then there's monitoring of uh, services that uh, help in setting up an external system that reacts to what's going on in our application and can fix our application or can report that there's high load and automatically s s set up more instances of our application to keep up with the load. But if you look closer and compare, compare this, uh, these APIs to the built pipeline, uh, they, they match basically to either to subscribe, to publish, and they still miss uh, the, the processing phase. So we, can, we know how to interact with external services, we know how to send data uh, over, but there are still some things missing. One is uh, processing of streams. Um, when they arrive to our service and we need to modify, for, modify the data to apply our business logic and send the data somewhere else. And uh, another thing is to 
uh, to do that, send the data somewhere else, so that we have means to really decouple our, uh, our service, send it to some system, usually broker, ideally a distributed broker, so there's no single point of failure. And then when other services are up and they're ready to process, then they will get the, the message and continue the pipeline. So there are two parts in, in the uh, processing pipeline. One is processing the messages uh, or the data in the, inside the service and then routing the, the data to some other service to continue the pipeline. And this is uh, still missing in MicroProfile, except uh, you can do, you can send messages, but not so decoupled. You can use uh, servers and events uh, to multiple clients if they actively connect, but if one of uh, the sites are, is down, uh, you, you get, uh, you lose messages. So it's uh, ideal to have a broker, which is the security, which is always running, that can get the messages and then route the messages to the services that uh, are ready to receive them. That's why uh, within MicroProfile, there's, uh, uh, there's a group that uh, focuses on uh, reactive operators to fill a gap in the processing area, to provide operators similar uh, to uh, what already reactive libraries provide, for example, Rx Java or there's uh, Reactor Project or Akka, they all provide these uh, operators, but the API is very different or sometimes even confusing. The, the same method does something else in different uh, libraries. So that's what we like to uh, address. And we also work with some uh, with uh, teams behind some of those libraries to support the API or and contribute to the API so that people who start learning reactive programming and want to process data, they don't need to learn every specific API for their for the library they want to use. They only can learn this and reuse it everywhere. Then another thing that is also being worked on is uh, reactive messaging, uh, which is bridging the gap between the services. So it's a, uh, an API to, to send service and receive, uh, send messages and receive messages. And you still need some, some broker like Kafka or any other messaging system uh, as an implementation, but the services don't need to do, know that. They don't need to have specific client for Kafka, specific client for any other message broker. They would just send a message, receive a message, and then when you deploy the services, you would deploy them with uh, the messaging provider you need, and the applications don't really, really need to care. And as a bonus, we are working on porting for fault tolerance interceptors into the asynchronous pipeline because MicroProfile already has fault tolerance interceptors uh, that allow you to handle failures in communication, but these only work right now in synchronous way. So for example, if you invoke a REST service and you wait for its result and there is an exception at a timeout or something, you can automatically configure it uh, to, to uh, the call to be retried couple of times, or circuit breaker pattern applied. If you want to uh, give, uh, if you want to open the circuit and not call the service because it's not responding for some time. So you cannot do all of these with single annotation, but uh, right now it only works in synchronous traditional way. Uh, and we are bringing this to, um, to reactive API. But um, I don't want to talk only about what's, what will be possible in the future. I want to say, I want to talk and explain what's possible even now with MicroProfile and to cover all these gaps with existing technologies. As I said, they won't be so standard as MicroProfile and so integrated in MicroProfile uh, as the new APIs, but it's already possible to use them. Um, and to cover the, the need of publishing and subscribing messages between services, uh, this is even possible with the Java E technology which is standard, it's uh, just uh, not part of MicroProfile. And uh, we can use uh, JCA, JCA API to plug into con to connectors to other message brokers like Kafka and have a unified API which resembles uh, message driven beans as we know them from JMS. Uh, so basically the same, same API that's we probably know from, from message brokers with annotations and just uh, in a, a method that receives uh, a message and then a connection factory that's used to open connection and send a message. And the rest we need to uh, cover with external libraries. So uh, I'm going to show how to use RxJava 
to uh, to do the processing, to implement the processing uh, within the service, to manipulate with data, and this library also provides some basic uh, fault tolerance uh, functionality, like setting up timeouts if some processing doesn't finish in, in some time, so that you don't need to wait for it eternally, but you get an exception there which you can process later. And then on the browser side, uh, I found React.js very nice to use because uh, it just uh, takes, can, can take an event, modify state, and then it automatically updates the UI. So it's not a reactive library per se, but it, it fits nicely if you just need to get them, uh, respond to a message from the server and update the UI accordingly with just a few lines of code. Um, and we can use Java EE and MicroProfile together. That's why I'm uh, talking about Java EE and, and the connectors. And uh, there are many servers that already support it. Uh, traditionally, Java EE servers already also supporting MicroProfile. So you can use both of them, both of the APIs in the same application. I'm going to show you how you can do that with my PyR Micro to run the application in the end when you uh, build your application around these uh, APIs. And the reason I'm using PyR Micro is uh, one of those is that I know it the best from other uh, compared to other application implementations. But it's also nice to do the demo because it's just an executable jar. I can use it to, to run the application I, I built previously. I can use it to build an executable jar with the application to just start it and don't care about uh, configuration. Um, so it's very easy to, to start the application in, in the demo with, with no, um, no much work. So this is uh, uh, an application that I would like to show you. I will continue now with more or less the demo, demoing the principles uh, I was talking about. And we'll start by consuming uh, data from an external service. Uh, it's a Bitcoin exchange service that I just chose because Bitcoin is quite fancy. Um, but it's, uh, the other reason I chose it is that the service provides a uh, continual stream of transactions. So as they happen on, on the, the exchange, uh, I can connect to uh, the WebSocket uh, interface and receive the, the transaction as even one by one. I can react to every single event separately, and I don't need to, to, the application doesn't need to request every event or batch of events as if I used a REST interface or something similar. And then I decided to separate processing into different uh, uh, services to, to show how to use reactive approach also in, in microservices architecture. So this is our really microservices because they are small, but it's only two of them. So in normal mi microservice architecture, would expect more, at least 10 or maybe 100 microservices, it depends on the project. Um, so I have two. One is data producer that reads, the, that gets the data. The, the, importance is, the order is important. It doesn't ask the, the exchange, it just connect to it and then uh, is ready to receive uh, information about transactions from the, uh, from the service. It responds to every transaction. Uh, which is uh, basically JSON data about the transaction, and then sends it uh, via the JCA connector to Kafka message broker, which uh, then either sends it so to the other service or stores the message until the other service is up and is av uh, available uh, and can consume the messages. And then again with the same uh, adapter via the JC JCA. Uh, the other service receives a message in a similar way as a message driven beans. You can see it late, later in the code that it's very similar if you already used message driven beans. And then to finalize our, my pipeline, I'm sending the events again to the browser so that browser gets updated automatically and doesn't need to p call the backend services to get the data, or even in the worst case, that's the worst case you would like to avoid, is to re force the user to refresh the page, because it's not reactive at all, it doesn't respond to the events, and <laughs> it's awkward because it's almost there, but the user still doesn't see it, so you would like to avoid it, and the best way, or one of the best ways is to send, send events to the UI and automatically update the UI according to the events. 
So that's it. The, the demo is also in the GitHub. And I'm just done with talking. I'll do the demo now. So first, let me show you an application. It's not very impressive. Just to show it's working, it shows uh, it connects to REST endpoints on the Bitcoin exchange and shows uh, the the Bitcoin rate, Bitcoin to dollar rate. But the reason it doesn't work is because I didn't start Kafka broker. So the data pro processor works, it gets messages from the external exchange, it sends it to the Kafka, but Kafka is not running, so I'll start the Kafka now. And once it starts, my application should st get start receiving messages, yes. so. These are real data that happen on the real Bitstamp uh, Bitcoin exchange. And we see that it's fairly active, but if there are not enough data, I can also use MicroProfile Config API, which I used in the, in the application, and bind the configuration to a file in directory and f force data producer to send fake messages if uh, there are not enough transactions for the demo, but I'm lucky that I have enough transactions so I can get real data and wait for them now. And this is all happening instantly as the messages are coming to the data producer via WebSocket, they go through Kafka, Kafka sends them to the, the front-end service and then it, uh, it follows to the browser via service and events. So I'm going to the code now. I have just two projects. One is a producer, one is uh, the, the front end, which is the consumer from Kafka. And to make, uh, to build uh, the project, uh, you basically need uh, Java E APIs, uh, MicroProfile APIs. I have some de uh, dependencies because of tests that I created but these are the, all the only dependencies you need to have, and one more, which is the JCA connector. It is uh, API and also implementation. And then for, for enhanced logging from, from the Kafka client, I added also SLF4J, that's it. Then I have a, a plugin that assembles all together, but we don't need to, we can also take uh, all the separate pieces uh, and uh, run them from command line, but for convenience, my build will create uh, an executable jar, which I can just uh, run simply like uh, this. So for example, I stopped now the, the data producer service, so you would see that there's no data, even though it's hard to tell because maybe that there are no transactions, but I'll refresh the page and there's nothing really going on, and if I look into the uh, the queue on Kafka, there's no messages, so I need to start the application now, and I just started as an executable jar. I could also start it with PyrMicro in, in, in this way, just to type PyrMicro jar, and then deploy the Kafka, Kafka Karar and, and uh, data producer but this requires more typing, so I pre-built everything and started uh, just that data producer as, an, as a simple jar. The advantage of keeping them separate is that if you want to really deploy them in the cloud and in Docker, it's much more convenient to have layers in Docker so that you only rebuild your application because the Kafka uh, adapter doesn't change very often, uh, the PyR runtime doesn't change very often, only every three months when you need to update uh, the runtime, what changes very often is your application. So you, you can rebuild it fast, you can deploy it to a, a Docker registry fast without moving big pieces of uh, jars around. And let's now go to the code. So let me start as the, as the data flow. They do flow to the data pro for producer which listens to events from the external exchange. I'm not going into details about how to connect to the exchange because uh, it provides a client, so I'm not using anything from MicroProfile or any other library to, to access WebSocket. There's a client 
which under the heart uh, uses WebSocket, so I only use that client provided by the exchange. And to separate the client, which is implementation detail, from the rest of my application, I use uh, CDI events. So as, long, as soon as I get data about a transaction, I uh, inject uh, uh, an event object from CDI and use it to fire the data. I do it asynchronously so that uh, the, the client to the exchange can receive more data without, without waiting for the processing to finish, and I can continue processing in another thread which is uh, available for processing. And then I have completely decoupled object which doesn't know anything about uh, uh, the Bitcoin exchange, which observes uh, the CDI event. So it only knows uh, the qualifier, which I used to mark. This is uh, the, the data from Bitcoin exchange, but it doesn't know where it came from. It, if we want later to switch to another exchange, we could use uh, modify just that one class that connects to the exchange, and so it would send um, it would trigger a CDI event, and then the, the rest of the code wouldn't change at all. And in this code. I'm going to process uh, the data and send it to the Kafka broker so that front-end service can, uh, uh, can use it and send it to the browser. So another piece, what I need is uh, to use Kafka uh, connector, which I configure here, but this is done only once, so I, I can put it in any class uh, just to configure uh, the name of the factory the interface, which is a, a Kafka interface, which is provided by the, uh, the resource adapter that I showed you, I need to add to Java E and microprofile dependencies. And, and that's it. And then I can uh, refer to the connection factory with that name and use it anywhere in my application. So I inject it here with factory, and then I use uh, it to create a connection and send the data. That's it. Here, uh, the API may slightly change between different brokers because if, uh, uh, every broker provides their own APIs, and this is basically an open source project, it's not a standard. So the, the project uh, that provides these connectors takes a lot of the APIs which are underneath, so they leak uh, uh, to the, the application. But it's also possible to, to create a connector that unifies all these and abstracts all of them. But on the other hand, there's not much need to do that in MicroProfile because we are expecting uh, the messaging, uh, messaging API which could replace this and, and even reduce the, line, the lines of code needed to make it running. But so far this is uh, one thing to use in MicroProfile to, to do the reactive messaging. Then uh, we're done with our first service. We send the data to Kafka, it's in a JSON format, it's uh, well, the format sent by the Bitcoin exchange, so we don't need to really process it. We'll process it on, on the other side. And uh, the other side, the other service uh, has a Kafka consumer, which now resembles the, the message-driven bean as, as we know it from JMS. There's a message-driven bean annotation, some activation config properties, which specify where to find Kafka, uh, which topics listen to it. When we use the, the same topic as we used when sending the data. So here we specified it in the method. When we called it, here we, specif we, we declare uh, the, the name of the topic which is on which this listener receives uh, the data. And then again, it is a good pat pattern to separate implementation details from business logic, so we just throw another uh, event which is handled somewhere else. And it continues to a processor, and this requires a little bit plumping, which wouldn't be necessary again with my, the future microprofile operators, where uh, it's, it's planned to integrate nicely with messaging so that you don't need any boilerplate to, to start building your pipeline. Here, I still need some, to somehow convert uh, the messages I receive from, the, from Kafka into Rx Java observables. So I have this class that does it. It just listens to the CDI events raised by the, the Kafka listener and then emits data to the observer. And as the last point, I have a class that connects to the Rx observer 
and builds a pipeline from, uh, from operators uh, present in RxJava. This is exactly what I would replace with uh, microprofile operators once they're, they are ready in microprofile. So what do I do here? Yeah, I, I do some logging that I received uh, data. I map the data to a service and event object, which is a wrapper that I can then use with microprofile uh, JAXRS API to send to the browser. And what I basically say, I specify just media type JSON and, and that's it. And then it's also important to remember on uh, error handling. When something goes wrong in reactive uh, API, you you can't catch it with try catch block. So even if in in normal code, if you don't catch exceptions, what happens? Exceptions are propagated from the method, and in the worst case, they end up in logs because in application servers and containers, there's always something wrapping your code, and if it gets exception, it just goes into the log so that you can see it. Uh, but in reactive uh, APIs, everything's running asynchronously. Everything is uh, running in uh, in sort of function somewhere else on a thread, and your original code continues in a different thread. So if I tried to catch all this block, I wouldn't get the exception because it's raised in a different uh, thread, completely out of my original processing. So I have to define an exception handler in the pipeline, so that the, uh, the engine that executes the pipeline knows what to do, what to call when there is an exception. And I do it with specifying another handler, another, another operator to one error, which is again specific to RxJava, and it would be replaced by microprofile operators API. And then I do need to do some finalization to close the resources. So everything is done in this uh, pipeline, which is different from sequential code, because every piece of the pipeline can be executed on a different thread. It may be executed on the same thread, but there's no guarantee there's nothing in between. So the, the same thread can do something else in between all these operations, because all of those operations may trigger some action, something that requires external service, and they would have to wait until uh, uh, until we get data, so the thread should be reused for something else if we want to save resources. And that's, that's the idea how it works. Uh, the, the advantage of these operators is that you can write the code as if it was exponential, so we can easily read how it goes one by one. But in fact, it's, uh, it can be executed in different threads. So it's multi-threaded even without it. Doesn't, it doesn't look like that. And the final thing is uh, we listened uh, to uh, service and requests from browsers, service and connections. And we register these connections to a broadcaster, which is also part of uh, JAXRS uh, API. And this is to notify all the client clients that are interested in transactions. Not only one client, but all of them that connect will receive the same message. The broadcast broadcaster will convert one message that we trigger into many messages for uh, me a message per or every client. So if I open the window again, uh, we'll get all the, again the same messages. Both windows will get the same messages for all the clients. If I would do, like to do something else, it's, it's surely possible. But this is one thing to remember if we want to burst the data to all the clients that we need to uh, send the data everywhere, not just to one client. And on the client side, that's quite easy. I'll just show the, the table component, which is uh, this table. And uh, what it does, it connects to the, the server sent event endpoint, which is somewhere. Did I open? No, I opened the wrong one. Here it is. So when the component is created and uh, appears on the web page, uh, the, uh, the JavaScript uh, application in the browser will connect to the server sent event with event source object and will 
specify what to do when uh, events come. And in the case that we have the event with transactions, it will update the model, so add the transaction to the model, and let uh, reactive do the uh, React do the rest. So we only need to specify how the UI should look like based on the state, and React will update the state accordingly as we use the variables in, in the template. So that's all we need to do. And yeah, it works like this. So it's quite easy to implement with not, not a lot of code. And with future versions of MicroProfile, it will get a lot easier. Uh, let me switch back to the application. So I would like to just finalize what I want to show you with some links to resources. If you want to know something about the cloud connectors that I used, uh, there's cloud connector for Kafka in this project. That's the, the first project. But it also the project also contains uh, connectors to cloud messaging systems like uh, messages broker in Azure and uh, mess a, uh, Amazon brokers. So you can use use that in the in the cloud when you uh, want to deploy microservices in in the cloud or in the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and then if you want to review, there's a release candidate for a final version of uh, MicroProfile operators which you can have a look at and compare to other libraries and see if, if it's what you expect and what you would like to use and comment on that because when, once there's final version I hope it will be the best version possible but it may be that we miss something and we would need to change it but it's always easy to change before there's a release. So that's basically it, something about me here. You can find me on the internet and I would be happy if you have questions about anything, microprofile, Java, E, Payara. Now is the time. Yeah? Uh, is there any plan to remove the JCA API? Just not that nice? Or... Uh, if the question was if there are any plans to improve the JCA APIs, uh, currently, no. Uh, the, one of the reasons is uh, that. Um, all these projects, JCA, JPA, uh, JMS, uh, all the APIs need to be transferred from JCP organization to Eclipse Foundation. And ev uh, there are groups formed around each specification and also all the other, all the implementations donated by uh, Oracle. And it takes some time to, f to form everything, to, to prepare all the people and also infrastructure because there are people who are ready to work on these things but the infrastructure and also legal stuff the copyrights and, and the licenses need to be resolved and then uh, people including me I'm <laughs> looking forward to it uh, are ready to work on uh, on Jakarta e specifications but in particular JCA may be superseded by other technologies uh, maybe this messaging uh, specification in a micro profile or it would be improved in that direction somehow. But uh, I, I still see JCA is valuable as an implementation of messaging. So there, me, me, reactive messaging is an application level API, which basically standardizes what, what I showed you, the, the interface is specific for Kafka, specific for, uh, for Azure service. So if you go to the project, the cloud connectors, if you use different brokers, the API is slightly different. So on that level, uh, the messaging API uh, is going to standardize the, these APIs, but to, to bridge these APIs in application to specific brokers, you still need something, some, something to, to connect your application to, to the broker. So I, I think uh, Payara will still use JCA underneath to, to provide uh, <coughs> connectors to all these brokers, while your application would use Unify API to, to access the messages. Any other, any other questions? Okay, then I've finished a couple of minutes before my time, but thank you.